grandchildren. We welcome everybody listening to us today. And we do say that this is the day that the Lord has made. Yippee! Thank you, Lord, for this day, Father God. Father, we have joy in our hearts today, Father. Father, we thank you for your goodness, your kindness, your mercy, Father God. Father, we thank you for your faithfulness, Father, in this place. And those that listen, Father, they will see and know of your faithfulness, Father, because you're a good God, you're a mighty God, Father. We bring this service before you today, Father God. And I know, Father, you're doing a mighty work in every single one of our hearts, Father. We thank you, Father, you're cleaning out all the mess, Father God. You're making us pure, Father. Your word says, be holy as you are holy, Father. So we are striving for that, Father. And I know by the help of your Holy Spirit, we will become holy people. Holy people as unto the Lord, Father. And we just thank you for that right now in Jesus' mighty name, Father. We pray for those that are ill today, Father. We pray for uh, uh, Bridget and Anthony. We pray for Lorraine, Father. We pray for those kidneys will work, Father. And uh, uh, Bridget and Anthony will be healed in Jesus' mighty name. Those that are listening will be healed and restored and renewed. Patricia, be healed in the name of Jesus. Father, we thank you for your Holy Spirit to do a mighty work in our midst. We thank you, Lord, for the gift of the discerning of the spirits today. We thank you, Lord, for your angels to attend to every precious person listening and those that are in the church, Father. We thank you for that right now in Jesus' mighty name, Father. We thank you, Pastor Bob, will preach the oracles of God, Father. That we thank you for the gift of uh, knowledge and, and prophecy, Father. In Jesus' mighty name, Father, we just thank you for that right now. Amen. You know what? There is change coming to our church. God's going to, he's going to heal every broken heart in this place. He's going to restore the hearts. He's going to restore families because that's what God's word is and God is and his love is all about. To restoring broken families and children and, uh, and, and, and grandchildren and, and those families that have been separated for so many years. God's going to restore every single one. Just trust him and see. He's going to wipe away your tears. Amen. He's going to heal every broken heart. So this 2023 expect... God to come through for you in a mighty way that, never, that you would never have thought. God's going to come through for every single one of us in Jesus' mighty name. He's going to surprise us in more ways than one. We're going to see signs, wonders, and miracles in Jesus' mighty name. Just lift your burdens up to Jesus and He'll remove it. And you'll feel light again and you'll put on your dancing shoes and you'll dance in the mighty name of Jesus. So this morning we're going to make a joyful noise unto the Lord. Hallelujah, Amen. hallelujah. Praise the Lord. Psalm 150. Praise God in His sanctuary. Praise Him in His mighty heavens. Praise Him for His acts of power. Praise Him for His surpassing greatness. Praise Him with the sounding of the trumpet. Praise Him with the harp and the lyre. Praise Him with the tambourine and dancing. Praise Him with the strings and the flute. Praise Him with the clash of the cymbals. Praise Him with the resounding symbols. Let everything that hath breath praise Amen. the Lord. Father, this morning it's an honor Thank to you. give glory you. to you, Father God, Amen. and to tell you how much we love and appreciate your goodness, Father God. We thank you, your Holy Spirit will manifest Himself in this congregation in a mighty way today, Father God. That every person that's needing something, Father, that you'll see to them, Father. You'll heal and restore them and renew their hearts this morning. In Jesus' mighty name, amen, amen. Lord, and we praise you this morning. We lift our hands in adoration as we praise you. Thank you. 
Thank you. I have a series that I'm going to start today. It's going to take three or four weeks. And I've uh, preached it before in this church. I, was, I did preach it at, a, at the Portuguese Evangelical Church as well when they asked me to go and minister there when they were running a course for their leaders. And, uh, and I really believe that God wants me to share this with you today. And I think... It's something that every Christian needs to hear and needs to understand. You see, today the church is being treated, not this church, you guys are here every week. Faithful. Faithful servants Faithful. of God, faithfully coming to corporately That's worship right. God, but we'll get into that in a bit. But it's you out there that's watching this by video that should be here. And you could be here. I know some of you live too far away, but you could be here. And the title of the message today is Why Church? Why do we have to go to church? Why is it so important to go to church? I saw the other day on Facebook this guy who I knew from a previous church that we ministered at. And uh, he, it's not the first time he's put this on Facebook. But he seems quite adamant about it, but he's in error. Why do I have to go to church? We are the body. We are the church. The church that we go to is the building. And he's quite right. But I don't know about you, but if you've got a car, a brand new Mercedes, or a brand new whatever, Toyota, whatever it is, that car has to go to the workshop to get maintained. That's right. And as Christians, we need to come to the workshop to get maintained. Absolutely. In Jesus' name. We all need it. Let me start by saying this to you, that church, your church, is your spiritual home. That's right. It's your spiritual home you need as a Christian. We are spirits. We live in a body. We have a soul. But we are spirits primarily. We are made in the image of God. God is spirit. And the Bible tells us that Jesus said God is seeking those who will worship him in spirit and in truth. So we are spirits and we need to have a spiritual home. Now your own home can be a spiritual home as well. Make no mistake about it. You can come and you can, uh, at home, you can go into your home, you can put on praise and worship music if you want to, you can, whatever it is, you can spend the time together in prayer and reading the Bible you can make that your spiritual home you can even have a little altar there if you want to but this here this church is your main spiritual home and I'll tell you why it's your main spiritual home it's your main spiritual home because you come here to be fed spiritually you, we come together as believers because we have something in common. We all have Jesus Hallelujah. in yes. common. Yes. Amen. Yes. Yes. And we gather together to worship him and to praise him. We also have other things in common. We have forgiveness in common. We have all the fruits of the Spirit in common. We can share the gifts of the Holy Spirit to encourage each and every one of us in common. That's why it's good to have a spiritual home and God wants your church, your local church to be your spiritual home. Listen to me. Paul the Apostle spent so much time recording in the book of Acts especially all about the church, the early church. How they used to meet in their houses. How they used to break bread together. And if we left one another to do that now, it probably would never happen. That's why we come to church to do it. In Jesus' name. Church building, the church itself, began many, many years ago. What they decided was, you can read in the book of Acts that God was adding to the church daily. And in one case, the church grew by 3,000 in one day. You cannot fit all those people into a house. And so it evolved. And what they did was they found a building that was 
uh, that was convenient to everybody else and they would all meet in the building. That's how church started. But the question we're asking today is, why church? When we ask a question or whenever I ask a question about anything of God or anything that's in his Bible, the first thing I ask is, what does Jesus say about it? And I'll tell you why. In your Bibles, in 1 Peter chapter 2, there's a little scripture there. A lot of people don't bother with it, but it's such an important scripture. Verse 21, sorry, I'll bring apart it. 1 Peter chapter 2 verse 21 says this. It says, for to this you were called, called what? Growing in the things of Christ, worshipping God, praising Him, praying to Him, trusting Him, believing in Him, reaching out to Him, living for Him. That's what you were called to. For to this you were called because Christ, also suffered for us. He went to the cross and he died the death that we should have died because the wages of sin is death. And he died that death for us so that we didn't have to die so that we could go free. For to this you were called because Christ also suffered for us, leaving us, underline this, leaving us an example. Leaving us an example that you should follow in his footsteps. You should follow his steps. So Jesus is our example in everything. So then the next question is, is Jesus our example when it comes to going to church? Well, we need to go to Luke chapter 4 to find the answer. Luke chapter 4. And verse 16. And it says there, so Jesus, he, Jesus, came to Nazareth where he had been brought up. And as his custom was, as his habit was, as he grew regular in because it became his custom. So he came to Nazareth where he had been brought up and, and, as his custom was, he went into the synagogue on the Sabbath day and stood up to read. The synagogue was his church. It was their church in those days. He was Jewish. He was brought up Jewish. He was brought up according to the Jewish custom. He died for the Gentiles. That's another story altogether. But he went to the synagogue on the Sabbath day Every Sabbath day. Some translations say, mine doesn't say it. And mine says, he went into the synagogue on the Sabbath day. Some translations say, he went into the synagogue every Sabbath day. And there he came to Nazareth, where he had been brought up. And as his custom was, he went into the synagogue on the Sabbath day and stood up to read. Now I'm going to give you a pamphlet when we're finished for you to take home, for you to read. It expounds on what I'm teaching you today and it'll give you a foundation for what we're, I'm going to be preaching on over the next two or three weeks. So I'm not going to take too long, I don't think, with the preaching today. But in Hebrews chapter 10 and verse 25, there the Bible itself warns us about missing church about missing church about finding excuses oh but the family's getting together today Lee and I have been doing this for 40 years and when the family gets together we go to the family after church and if it's too far away we don't go we excuse ourselves because our worship of God is far more important to us the only times we've ever missed church is when one of us has been too unwell to make it to church uh, or when we've been away on holiday. And let me tell you, when we go away on holiday, the first thing we do is find out where the local church is so that we can go to church. And if we can't, then we have church together wherever we are. But in Hebrews chapter 10, and verse 24, 
But let's read from verse 23. It says there, let us hold fast the confession of our hope. Coming to church is a demonstration of that. Let us hold fast the confession of our hope without wavering, without being double-minded, without doubting. For, the, for he, that's God, who promised is faithful. God is faithful. All his promises are yes and are amen. We're going to deal a little bit more with that in time to come. Verse 24. And let us consider, this is now God's reasons for us coming to church. Let us consider one another in order to stir up love and good works towards one another. Helping one another. We're one body. Listen, this leg of mine, if it doesn't want to work with the rest of my body, it will die off. It will get gangrene and they'll take it off. Because the blood would not be circulating there. But my heart is pumping blood all around my body and the blood is moving all around and making every part of my body active. In Jesus' name. And so it is with the church. The blood of Jesus is circulating through the church. And the whole church, the whole congregation, the whole body in this church should be active towards one another. Not forsake and, and, order, and stirring up love and good works. Not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together as is the manner of some, but exhorting one another, and so much more as you see the day approaching. Now, I never experienced this myself when I, when Lee and I met and we decided to get married, we had to become Catholics, because Lee was a Catholic. And uh, we were Catholics for a short time, maybe two years, and then they booted us out because of our belief and what the scripture says and the gifts of the Holy Spirit and things like that. But there's no need to go into all that detail. But what I want to tell you is when I was a little kid living in 10 Limney Avenue, Ernie Central Plymouth, <laughs> our next door neighbours, our new next door neighbours that moved in, they were people that came from Malta. They were Maltese. And they were staunch Catholics. And one day I, I was outside, I was small, I was smaller than Trent. Trent's big now, so. But uh, I was a youngster and I was outside in the garden playing with the, the new neighbours, two children, a girl and a boy. And we were playing and then I saw a car pull up and a priest got out. And the priest went into the house. The next thing is, the mother came out and called the two kids and they also had to go in. Eventually they came out and they told me, no, we had to go in because the priest wanted to speak to us. And he told us that we were in big sin because we missed church last Sunday. Now, I'm not saying it's a sin to miss church. I'm not saying that at all. Let me just tell you something about God. God doesn't want you to come to church because you feel forced to come to church. God doesn't want you to give financially to the church because you feel forced to do it. God doesn't want you to sing and clap your hands because you feel forced to do it. God wants you to do it simply because you love Him. And you want to be obedient to Him, you want to be pleasing to Him, but you want to demonstrate your love and your faith towards Him. And if you don't come to church... He's not going to come and wrap you over the head. The Holy Spirit will convict you. Make no mistake about it. The Holy Spirit will work in your heart. But I want to tell you something. God will stand back whenever you're disobedient. If you backslide, he'll stand back and he'll just wait. And he'll wait for you. He might change some circumstances. The Holy Spirit will be working in your heart. But God, he'll just wait. The Bible says today is the day of salvation. He who endures to the end shall be saved. At the end, is God still waiting for you? Or are you involved with God? Are you truly 
involved. And that's why he's got in the scripture, not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together, as is the manner of some, but exhorting one another, and so much more as you see the day approaching. Somebody put a comment on this guy's Facebook thing. I, you know, I told you I knew this guy from another church that he went to. And they put the comment on and they quoted this scripture. And he came back and he said, But who says I don't meet together with other Christians? Well, I can tell you something. I can tell you that if he is meeting together with other Christians, he now needs to ask himself, is it on a regular basis? He needs to ask himself, the Bible says that God has given to the body of Christ some to be apostles, some to be pastors, some to be evangelists, some to be teachers. Do you have that in your meeting? Do you have a pastor who's teaching you in your meeting? Do you have, uh, if God calls you to be, to be involved in evangelism, do you have that facility in that home where you are? We've done evangelism. In this very church, we've taken the church out every Saturday morning doing evangelism. We've done it. And we were able to do it. Why? Because we were working together as a group, as a congregation, as a part of the body of Christ in this local church. We went out and we shared the gospel of Jesus Christ. So the Bible warns us not to miss church. Praise God. God doesn't want us to miss church. There are scriptures, I don't have them here, but they come in the next week or two in the notes, I know. And uh, it says that Jesus joins us in our time of praise to worship the Father. He joins us. He's here spiritually with us today. If Jesus was able to walk through that door there, and he was able to walk in and manifest himself physically, and you could see him, well, I don't think he would probably be able to stand up in his presence. He would probably fall to the ground in submission. But even if you couldn't, make no mistake, you would be, oh, hallelujah, shouldn't I, shouldn't I, on your best behavior, because Jesus was here. And make no mistake, you would have the greatest respect for him, because you would know this is the Son of God. But because he's here in spirit, and you can't see him with your physical eyes, and you're too lazy to look at him with your spiritual eyes, you don't celebrate that time that you're having with him. Because he says, where two or more are gathered in my name, there I am in the midst of them. He's here with us. He's here with us today. Why do you think when he stood up here? I felt it. I felt it from the moment we started the church service. When she woke up, Walked up here, she said, Joe, the anointing, I can already stand up. Why? Because Jesus and the Holy Spirit are always present in this service. And I've said to many times to the congregation here, maybe the other people who have left the church, and I've said, can you feel his presence? Can you feel his presence? I had one guy come up to me, and he said to me, he said, you know what? I can never feel his presence. I wish I could feel his presence like you do. And I sat down and I talked to him. And I can tell you he had so many other things in his heart that he had no room for the presence of God. You have to make room for the presence of God. You have to trust God. You have to know that when you make a decision and you take it before God and God gives you permission or the word of God shows that God is in agreement with your decision, you then have to trust God and keep on trusting God without wavering. Even if it doesn't manifest when you think it should manifest, even when it doesn't appear to be happening when you think it should be happening, because God's timing is perfect. And the Bible tells us in Hebrews chapter 11 that there were many men and women of faith that trusted God, that did things, they lived by faith, they did great exploits by faith, but there were some things that they were believing God for by faith that never even manifested in this life. Why? Because God is more interested in you having faith and trust in Him than you receiving from Him. He wants to bless you. He really wants to bless you. He delights 
and the prosperity of his servants. The Lord is your shepherd, you shall not lack. Yes, amen. He delights and partaking for you and providing for you and, 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 and giving you all your needs. My God shall supply all your needs according to his riches and glory by Christ Jesus. Hallelujah. Matthew chapter 22. Matthew chapter 22. Please understand, I'm not coming down on anybody unless you're watching this by video, but we're also going to be dealing with what I've just said now. I'm not coming down on anybody here because the people that are here today are people that are faithfully here week in and week out. I'm just giving them a background of why we need church because there's this antichrist teaching that's going out at the moment about you don't need to be in church. Let me tell you, you do need to be in church. Matthew chapter 22, verse 23. So this word should be encouraging those of you who are already trying to fulfill this. And this word should be convicting those of you that need to do this. Matthew chapter 22, verse 23. The same day the Sadducees, who say there is no resurrection, came to Jesus and asked him, saying, Teacher, Moses said that if a man dies, having no children, his brother shall marry his wife and raise up offspring for his brother. Verse 25. Now there were with us seven brothers. They made this story up. The first died after he had married and had no offspring. He left his wife to his brother. Likewise, the second also, and the third, even to the seventh. Last of all, the woman died also. Therefore, in the resurrection, whose wife of the seven will she be? For they all had her. You see, it was a custom under the law in those days. Thank goodness it's not a custom today. But anyway, uh, <laughs> if a guy was married to a woman, and she didn't have a child, and he died, then she would have to go and be with his brother, and marry the brother. Then he would try and give her a baby. If he died, then she would have to go to another brother. And so it would go on and go on. Here they're making this story up, and they said there were seven of them. And whose wife will she be in the resurrection? Likewise, the second also, and the third even to the seventh. Last of all, the woman died also. They fell for in the resurrection, whose wife of the seven will she be? For they all had her. And Jesus answered, I want you to catch this. Jesus answered and said to them, you are mistaken. You don't know the scriptures, nor the power of God. For in the resurrection, they neither marry nor are given in marriage, but they are like angels of God in heaven. You see, you need to have a spiritual home. You need to have a church because you won't grow if you don't have it. Right. You need to come to church yeah. to learn what the scriptures are saying. I can tell you now, if I close this Bible and we close down the church and I just say to you all, okay, guys, off you go home, you? you must have church every Sunday in your home. Yeah. I bet you you won't do it. You might do it for a week or two. But I'll tell you now something. You will stop doing it. You'll get weaker and weaker. And you will stop growing spiritually. And you will stop learning what the scripture says. And like I said to you. A car has to go into a workshop for maintenance. So you need to have a spiritual home. You, it's so important that you have this spiritual home. Then... I'm just touching some of this you find in, in what, uh, the, the pamphlet I want to give you, but uh, it's a little bit more in depth there. Then we deal with church hoppers. When I'm talking about church hoppers, I'm talking about people, we've had them come visit us in this church, come and join the church and then after church, 
oh, Pastor Bob, I loved I loved your praise and worship, and uh, I really loved your preaching, and uh, I, I need to go away and pray about this. The only thing is, Pastor Bob, uh, we're so used to a big band that they got at the Raymer Church or a Christian Family Church or Maranatha. We, we, we're used to this. We're used to the big band and the, and the choirs and all the rest of it. Listen, nowhere in the Bible does it say you've got to have a big band. What it says is we need to praise and worship. And God wants us to praise and worship Him in spirit and in truth from our hearts, not to go to a church where we get entertained. That's right, that's right. There's too much entertainment. Yeah. Some of the churches have become, I was reading an article uh, the other day, and please, I'm not criticizing, I'm just stating uh, uh, st statistical facts. And that is this that the church in America, the mega churches, are declining slowly. They took a big decline during COVID, and they're still dec declining. But the smaller churches are, are, are popping up. There's more of them popping up yeah. on street corners in America. Can I tell you now, at the moment, the average congregational size of the average church in America is 50 people. When you look at some of the mega churches, you can't believe that. But it's a statistical fact. So you need a spiritual home so that you can learn what the scripture says, you can learn about the gifts of the spirit, you can learn about God and all the rest of it. Sometimes you'll hear me asking you, have you been baptized? And, and telling you, you need to be baptized. If you haven't been baptized, I think we've all been baptized here. But if you haven't been baptized, you need to speak to me because we need to get you baptized. But I'm talking about people, like I said just now, they are church hopping. Now, what is the problem with church hopping? Let me first read to you James chapter 5, verses 13 to 16. Is anyone among you suffering? Let him pray. Is anyone cheerful? Let him sing psalms. Is anyone among you sick? Let him call for the elders of the church and let them pray over him, anointing him with oil in the name of the Lord. And the prayer of faith will save the sick, and the Lord will raise him up. And if he has committed sins, he will be forgiven. Confess your trespasses to one another, and pray for one another that you may be healed. The effective, fervent prayer of a righteous man avails much. If you're a church hopper, that ain't going to happen. That's not going to happen. I can give you a good example. Not only... Uh, on the most recent occasion, but this has occurred previously as well, where people have asked us to minister to them, come and pray for me, I'm sick, or come and help me, uh, my marriage is suffering, we're going to get a divorce, please come and help us, and all the rest of it. And when you go along and you see the people, and you say to them, you need to come to church on Sunday, oh, come on church, what church do you go to? So and so. But why have you called me and not your pastor? Oh, no, no, my pastor doesn't know. And in fact, I don't know my pastor or the leaders of the church that well. You see, here I've just read to you. Is anyone among you suffering? Let him pray. Is anyone cheerful? Let him sing a song. Is any among you sick? Let him call for the elders of the church and let them pray over him, anointing him with oil in the name of the Father. And the prayer of faith will save the sick and the Lord will raise him up. You see, that's all a part of church life. That's all a part of your life in a spiritual home where the pastor knows you. My pastor knows me. And when my pastor prophesies over me or my pastor has a word for me from the Lord, I know it's from God. Right. I've seen him speak and I've seen it come to pass. If I went to a big church, that pastor would probably never ever even talk to me. He would have somebody else that would come and talk to me if I got involved in that church like that. And she declared to them, I will never leave Jesus' Lord Ministries. It's a small church, but it's such a, sp a church that's spiritual and close to the Lord in Jesus' name. So church hopping has massive disadvantages because you'll never be known by the pastor. You will never be shepherded 
God works in this illustration, if you like. He works. He starts in Psalm 23 by saying, the Lord is my shepherd. In John chapter 10, or John chapter 8, I'm not sure which one, Jesus says, I am the good shepherd. Then he calls pastors shepherds. And he calls the congregation sheep. He relates to us. Now, I'm going to say something that is not meant to offend you, but if you speak to specialists in farming, they'll tell you how stupid sheep can be. That's why you need a shepherd. I'm also a sheep, but I'm also a shepherd. Proverbs chapter 27 speaks about this. Proverbs chapter 27 says this. We're nearly finished. If I can get through these scriptures quickly. Proverbs chapter 27 says, in verse 23, it's a word to pastors. This is a teaching to pastors. And it says, be diligent to know the state of your flocks and attend to your herds. Now that's a scripture that is in line with another scripture in Isaiah, which I'm not uh, working on today, but in another time. How on earth can a shepherd or a pastor be aware of the state of his flock if his flock are missing all the time? We have a person that's supposed to be a member of Jesus, his Lord Ministries, that whenever they've got problems, they're always sending a message, please pray, please do this, please do that, but you never see them in church. How on earth can a pastor know the state of his flock if his flock are absent from church or if they're not in relationship with the pastor and the leadership of the church? How can he know that? That's why God has designed it, that we need to come to church. So you need to have a spiritual home. You need to avoid being a church hopper. The next thing I want to tell you is what we call, I've got a whole message on it, but I'm not going to share the whole message today. It's for another time. But I'm going to touch on it because it's one of the reasons why we need to have a church and what the devil uses to try and destroy the church. He tries to do, destroy the church by church hoppers, by making things in church pleasing to your flesh so that you go from this church to that church. Oh, I'm tired of this church. I'm tired of Pastor Bob speaking the truth. Or he says it's the truth. I'm tired of listening to it. I'm going to this new church down the road. I've heard it's a very good church. And there, they, they're so loving and so welcoming. And so off this person goes to the church down the road. They join that church. They've been going there for a couple of weeks. Then they found that the pastor is starting an early prayer, morning prayer meeting at 5 o'clock in the morning, three times a week. And he expects everyone in the congregation to be there at 5 o'clock in the morning before everybody goes to work. I can't get up at 5 o'clock in the morning. It's ridiculous. I thought this was a good church. I'm out of here. And he goes swimming out. Down to the church, down to the next room. And so it goes on, and it goes on, and it goes on. God uses church hopping to destroy you spiritually. The next thing that I want to speak about, which I've got another message on, is what I call spiritual cancer. Spiritual cancer. I want to read a scripture to you first. Matthew chapter 7, verses 1 to 5, Jesus is speaking. Jesus says in Matthew chapter 7, verses 1 to 5, Judge not, that you be not judged. For with what judgment you judge, you shall be judged. And with the measure you judge, it will be measured back to you. And why do you look at the speck in your brother's eyes, but you don't consider the plank that's in your own eye? Or how can you say to your brother, let me remove the speck from your eye and look, a plank is in your own eye. eye. Well, this is what Jesus is calling you. Hypocrite! First remove the plank from your own eye 
and then you'll see clearly to remove the speck from your brother's eye. A critical spirit the devil uses, the devil tries to destroy churches, he tries to destroy Christian companies, he tries to destroy marriages by introducing a critical spirit. I wonder why the church hasn't grown. There's something wrong. It must be past the ball. There must be something wrong with it. He must be doing something wrong for the church not to grow. I don't like what Pastor Lee said when she was preaching last week. Did you hear what she said? I'm sure she, was, she said it just to get at me. And then you start talking, and you start stirring up other people, and they start criticizing, and then this spiritual cancer, this critical spirit, it grows. And let me tell you, it is so contagious. Avoid it. Avoid it like the plague. Keep away from it. 2 John chapter 1, verses 9 to 11. 2 John. 2 John, chapter 1, verses 9 to 11. There's only one, one uh, chapter in 2 John, so I hope it's right. 9 to 11. Whoever transgresses and does not abide in the doctrine of Christ, whoever transgresses, whoever sins, whoever puts his foot wrong, and does not abide in the doctrine of Christ, because if you abide in the doctrine of Christ, you know the forgiveness of God. You see, it's not when we make a mistake that there's a problem. It's what we do when we make a mistake. So whoever transgresses and does not abide in the doctrine of Christ does not have God. Doesn't have God. He who abides in the doctrine of Christ has both the Father and the Son. He's got the Father, the one who gave his only begotten son and he has a son the one who died in his place so that he could be forgiven in Jesus mighty name verse 10 if anyone comes to you and does not bring this doctrine do not receive him into your house nor greet him for he who greets him shares in his evil deeds so avoid it. Avoid that critical spirit. If you feel, you know, most pastors, me included, don't mind criticism. If it's constructive criticism. But if you're going to come and criticize the way somebody dresses when they come to church, and maybe you don't know their circumstances, but Pastor Bob does, we used to have a person who used to come to this church in flip-flops and in dirty Baggy shorts and a t-shirt, week in, week out, winter and summer. And we started to buy clothes for that person. We give them a packet of clothes, new shirt, long pants, pair of sandals, and whatever else it was. And give it to them. And then they left the church. <laughs> but they left the church for other reasons, disciplinary reasons. But the point that I'm trying to make, if you're going to come and criticize, or if you've, got a, uh, if you've got a criticism, come and share it with me. Because if it's a constructive criticism, I will take it on board, and we will use it for the benefit of the church. If it's not a constructive criticism, and it's a critical spirit, I will discern Make no mistake, I will discern that critical spirit and I will spiritually deal with the spirit. Not with you, I will deal with the spirit in Jesus' name and give you edification. Romans chapter 15 and verse 7 says this, Therefore receive one another just as Christ also received us to the glory of God. You have no right to turn away any Christian who comes to you to speak to you or to ask you for advice or to just maybe have somebody pray with them 
or just spend a few minutes with and fellowship, you have no right to chase them away. This is what the Bible says. And I'll tell you why. Because Christ accepted you just as you are with all your warts, with all of your funny feelings, with all of your unhealthy smell, spiritual smell, that is, with all those things, Christ still accepted you. It tells you in Romans chapter 6, yet while we were still sinners, while we were still in our sin, Jesus died for us so that we could have the choice of salvation. He did the work first. Then he gave us the choice. And if we are good enough for Jesus Christ, what right do you have to say this person is not good enough for you? Ephesians chapter 4. I'm almost finished, but you're not nearly there. Ephesians chapter 4, verse 29. Let no corrupt word proceed out of your mouth, but what is good for necessary edification. That word edification can also be encouragement. It's the same word in the Greek. That it may impart grace to the hearers. I'll read it again. Let no corrupt word God considers a, a, a critical spirit, an unhealthy critical spirit, to be corrupt. Make no mistake about it. You speak against. There's a scripture in the Old Testament, I think it's in Proverbs, that says, Woe unto him who would touch the anointed of God. Jesus said, With your words you murder. And he warns us against it. And here again, the Apostle Paul is saying in Ephesians 4 and verse uh, 29, and he's saying, Let no corrupt word proceed out of your mouth. Only that which is good and necessary for edification, that it may impart grace to the hearers. And those words are not corrupt. Then, in Philippians chapter 2, I think a lot of these scriptures are in the pamphlet here, but I'm reading them to you in case you got lazy and you don't bother to read the pamphlets. And those of you watching my video, you can contact us and you can ask us for a pamphlet. And we'll make sure you get a pamphlet yeah. in Jesus' name. Philippians chapter 2 verse 13 says this, For it is God who works in you both to will and to do for his good Pleasure. Yes, Lord. God is working in you to do His will in you for His good pleasure. I don't like that guy that comes to church. You know, he sits there, he stares at everybody, and he mutters things under his breath. I don't know what's wrong with him. And you know, sometimes when he comes to talk, I just don't want to talk to him. He's so negative. Listen. God might be working in that person. You don't know what God is doing in that person's life. You don't have a clue what's going on in that person's life. And if they're a born again believer, God is possibly, maybe you are in a higher level of faith than that person, but God is working in them. And it's your job to encourage them all the time. In Jesus' name, I could spend a whole message just on this itself. Sometimes, I can say this quite now, there have been people that have come to this church, they've left this church because of something I've said when I've been preaching. I've had them say, do you remember two weeks ago when you said so-and-so, so-and-so, and you were talking to me? And I said, no, I wasn't talking to you, I was preaching to the congregation. But what I do say to them is, Maybe the Lord was talking to you. Maybe it applied to you. I don't know. I don't know what God's doing in your life. That's another reason why the pastor needs to know you. Then, the last reason why people leave the church, why the, the hope that the devil's got to try and destroy churches and you'll never destroy this church. 
He'll never destroy this church. My wife and I, we've had opportunity to go and pastor other churches, bigger churches, wealthier churches, to be able to be full-time in the ministry and have a decent salary. We've had that opportunity. But each time I've gone before God, and I've prayed about it, and I've said, Lord, not my will, but your will be done. And God's always said, I want you to stay there until I tell you to go. And that's why we're still here today. Somebody said to me the other day, why don't you send out your CV? Send it out to America, send it out to here, send it out to there. And I said, because God wants me here. Luke chapter 6 and verse 31 says this. Jesus is speaking, he says, and just as you want men to do to you, you should also do to them. We must treat other people with respect. We must love the unlovely. That's what the Bible tells us. We must love the ones that are difficult to love. We must love them. You see, love is not an emotion. Love is not a feeling. Love is a command of God. When a couple come to me for marriage counselling and the woman says to me, I don't love him anymore. He's been treating me wrong all this time. I don't love him. I want to get out of this marriage. I want to get divorced. Then we have to take her to one side on her own and speak to her and tell her, listen, you're commanded to love God. Uh, you're commanded to love your husband. And what we need to do now is to try and work through this thing and see if we can't get you back to the first love that you had for your husband. That's what happens in a lot of marriages. They lose their first love. You know, let me just tell you something. Yesterday I went to the shops with my wife, got out of the car, and some woman there was going to her car, and she told my wife how beautiful she is. And it really made my wife's day. She was smiling and happy. She said, oh, glory to God and all this. And that's not the first time it's happened. It's happened many times. People have stopped and said, gee, but you're beautiful. <laughs> gee, but this, gee, but that. And I, I said to my wife, how come nobody tells me that? And we shouldn't worry or be offended when somebody else gets blessed or when somebody else is still they're beautiful or somebody else receives a miracle from God. We shouldn't get upset or get offended because we should be treating others as we want to be treated ourselves. Now, lastly, I'm going to finish off with this. And uh, let me tell you something, treating others as you want yourself to be treated. Usually people will say, I'm looking for the perfect church. You're never going to find the perfect church. Because there isn't no perfect church. Let me see if this is the scripture that I want here. Let's get back to your minutes. And I'll tell you why we, you won't uh, find the perfect church. Jesus gave us the answer quite clearly here. It is not the scripture that I wanted to use, so I'm going to add a bit. There was a rich young ruler, and he came to Jesus, and he said, Jesus, he watched Jesus do miracles, and he said to Jesus, he said, good teacher, what do I have to do to inherit the kingdom of God? And Jesus said to him, why do you call me good? In some translations, it says, why do you call me perfect? Because in the Greek language, the word good means perfect. Why do you call me perfect? Because there's only one that's perfect, and that's my Father in heaven. Nobody is perfect. We all make mistakes. That's why we have to give consideration to each other. Why we have to understand that God's working in each other at different levels, trying to change their lives around, trying to get them to where they want to be, or where God wants them to be, let me rather say. And it's the same with the church. You're never going to find a perfect church. Never. But what we try to do here at Jesus' Lord Ministries is we do try our very, very best 
prayerfully to have a church of excellence. A church of excellence. In Jesus' name. I wouldn't want you to be in some corner of a shop somewhere having church or in some dirty old office block having church. I want you to be in a nice place with a nice atmosphere. I want you to experience church with a reasonable sound system where we can record the meetings or write the videos and, and our re recordings. They are part of our ministry, sending them out. They go out all over the world. Well, they go out on YouTube and Facebook. People all over the world watch them. We may not be the perfect church, but we believe by showing God faithfulness and excellence, we will achieve a lot in Jesus' name. Lastly, in Psalm 133, hear this and hear it regarding what I've just said to you. Psalm 133, Behold, how good and how pleasant it is for brethren and sistren, for brethren to dwell together in unity. And it's like the precious oil upon the head running down on the beard, the beard of Aaron, running down on the edge of his garments. And it's like the dew of Hermon descending upon the mountains of Zion. This is speaking about God. It's speaking about the priesthood. It's speaking about the Holy Spirit. It is like the dew of Hermon descending upon the mountains of Zion, which represents the church, by the way. For there the Lord commanded the blessing, the blessing, life forevermore, life forevermore. The greatest blessing that you can receive is not that couple hundred thousand rand that you need at the moment, not that, uh, not a nice quiet wife to replace the nagging wife that you got. The Bible says it's better for you to go and sit on the roof of your house than to share the house with a nagging wife. No, not that at all. God sees your biggest blessing as salvation, eternal life in Jesus' name. And this has gone over. I thought it was going to be shorter than this, but it's gone over a bit. And uh, we'll continue on next week with the rest in this series. But what I want to do right now is to give you all a copy of this pamphlet. I want you to take it home. I want you to read it. It supports what I've been saying. It's a teaching on what I've been saying. If you've got any questions about it, please feel free to make a note of your questions and to either contact me or when you come to church next week, you can ask me questions and I'll try my best, to, uh, myself and Lee, to answer them in Jesus' mighty name. Lord, we partake of these elements. Because Jesus said whenever we do it, we must do it in remembrance of him. Lord, we do it as an act of faith, showing that we are consuming the work of the cross. We are consuming that which Jesus paid for us. And we are receiving that blessing that we just read in Psalm 133, life forevermore. In Jesus' name, let's eat of the bread together. Cup of grace, let's drink together. Praise God, hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Praise God. Thank you, Jesus. Father, we just thank you that. We know it's the beginning of 2023, Father. Many, many people are crying out to you, even those that are in this, uh, their names that are written in this book, Father. Father, that you will heal and restore and renew them, Father, that you will provide for them, Father God. Father, you'll give them the desires of their heart. Father, you'll send them signs, wonders, and miracles, Father God. Father, we just thank you, Lord God, that every prayer of every precious person will be answered, Father God. 
And Father, you'll just surprise them with your goodness, Father. And you'll give them whatever yes. they've prayed for according to your word, Father. Thank you, we thank you for that right now in Jesus' mighty name. Amen. We pray for the sick, Father. We pray for the oppressed and yes. depressed, Father. Amen. We pray for the lost and lonely, Father. Amen. We thank you, Lord, you'll make a way for them thank where you, there Lord. seems to be no way, Father God, in, in Jesus', Jesus mighty name. name, amen. Hallelujah. Father, we thank you. Yes, Lord. In good measure, press down, shaken together, running thank over, shall men fall back into our bosom. In Jesus' in mighty name. name. Jesus Bless them a hundredfold, yes, Father, amen. in Jesus' mighty name. Amen. 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 The Bible says God loves a, a cheerful, cheerful giver. giver. A cheerful amen. A testimony, well, not really a testimony, you know, when I get my pension, whatever money comes into my hands, my, the very first thing, I'm so petrified to go and spend anything, the very first thing I do a bank transfer, and then I say, Lord, I worship you with my tithe and offering, and I know I'm protected because the word of God promises that when you are a tither and a giver, you can expect God's protection over your life and your family's life in Jesus' mighty name. Amen. Amen. Praise God. So the Lord bless you. The Lord bless and keep you. Make his face shine upon you. Be gracious to you and give you peace. In Jesus' mighty Amen. name. Have a good week. Expect something good to happen yes, to you because Amen. God is a good God and he loves you too much to leave you the way you are. Amen. The Amen. Contact Amen. details come up after the video. So you can contact us if you need a copy of that pamphlet. In Jesus' name, till the next time, God bless Have you. Have a blessed week. God bless you.